Prince Michigan and hold the relish. It's not only that Pink's has the best hot dogs in what we have come to accept as a civilized world, and that includes Nathan's, the original standout of Coney Island, not these fast shuffle Mickey Mouse surrogates that have opened up from time to time all the way from Broadway to, to the San Fernando Valley, which in a less enlightened era I thought was the dispenser of the Nipla Ultra Frankfurters. It is also that Michael, who works at Pink's, is one of the best conversationalists on the subject of Dostoevsky in what we have come to accept as a civilized world, and that includes the academic turned screenwriter from New York who did a sort of kind of Dostoevsky film about an academic turned gambler back in 1974, which double incentive explains why I was down there at 711 North La Brea Avenue, almost at the corner of Melrose at Pink's, founded in 1939 by Paul Pink with a bush cart at that very same location, where a heaven sent hot dog cost a decent 10 cents, what now sets one back a hefty dollar and a quarter punch under the heart, even if the quality of dog has not diminished one iota or even a random scintilla. Quality and Michael Bernstein, who knows what there is to know about the fabulous Fyodor, were the double incentives to drag me out at dead midnight because I had been lying there in my bed, all the way out on the top of the Santa Monica Mountains in the middle of the Mulholland Scenic Corridor, overlooking the twinkling lights of the bedroom communities of the San Fernando Valley, which, I have been led to believe, each one represents a broken heart that couldn't make it to Broadway, unable to sleep, tossing and turning, turning and tossing, winter shins and tormented, backing and filling in my lightly starched bed sheets, and of a sudden visions, not of sugar plums, but of dancing hot dogs, fandangoing frankfurters, waltzing weenies, gavotted through my restless head. 11.30, for God's sake, and all I can think about was sinking my fangs into a Pink's hot dog and discussing a little Katamatsov hostility with this Israeli savant who ladles up chili dogs on a graveyard shift behind the steam table. Go figure it. Facts are definitely facts. So at midnight, I'm pulling into the parking spaces beside Pink's, right next door to that shoe store that sells funny Italian disco shoes, the heels of which fall off if you spin too quickly on the misguided belief that you are the reincarnation of Valentino or merely just the latest Travoltanoid to turn female heads. And I'm slouching up to the counter, and Michael sees me coming even before I'm out of the car, and he's got a hot one working ready to hand me as I lean up against the clean but battered stainless steel counter. Just a dog, light on the mustard, hold the relish, no chili, yuck the chili, I'm a purist. And as the front four sink into that strictly kosher nifty, Michael opens with the following. It wasn't his fault he was so mean to women. Dostoevsky was a man swayed by passions. Two of these, his lamentable love for Paulina Soslova and his obsession for gambling overlapped. I'm halfway finished with the first, Frank, as Michael is building the second, and I respond, you see how you are? You, like everyone else, are ready to condemn a genius simply because he was a liar, a cheat, a pathological gambler who borrowed from his friends and never paid them back, a man who deserted his wife and children, an epileptic existentialist who merely wrote at least half a dozen of the greatest works of the fiction the world has ever seen. If he brutalized women, it was simply another manifestation of his tormented soul. And give me another dog, light on the mustard, hold the relish. Having now defined the parameters of our evening's discussion, we could sit down to arguing the tiniest, most obscure points, as long as the heartburn didn't start and the hungry hookers and junkies coming in for sustenance didn't distract Michael too much. Ha! Michael shouted, aiming his tongs at my head. Ha! And ha, again, you fall into the trap of accepted cliché. You mythologize the Russian soul, several thousand years retroactive angst, when the simple truth that every man in Dostoevsky's novel treats women monstrously invalidates your position. The canon itself says you are wrong. Name one exception of substance. Not a minor character, a major one, a moving force, an image, an icon. Name one. I licked my fingers, nodded for my third sally of the night, and said, with the offensive smugness of one who has lured his worthy opponent, hip deep into quicksand, Prince Mishkin. Michael was shaken. I could tell, shaken. He slathered too much mustard onto the dog. Shaken, he wiped all the excess with a paper napkin, and shaken, he handed it across to me. Well, yes, of course, Mishkin, he said slowly, devastated and groping for intellectual balance. Yes, of course, he treated women decently, but he was an idiot. And the six-foot-two pimp with the five working girls at the far end of the counter started screaming about sleazy, kike, honky motherfucker countermen who let their Zionist hatred of third-world peoples interfere with the speedy performance of their duties. But, but the image of the brutalizer of women was the one with which Dostoevsky identified. He started toward the other end of the counter where black fists were pounding on stainless steel. Mishkin was his model, I called after him. Some men are good for women. He held up a chili-stained finger for me to hold that place in the discussion and rushed away to call the lynch tenor in the mob. And as I stood there, 
I looked across La Brea Avenue. The street was well lit, and I saw this guy standing at the curb right in front of the Federated Stereo Outlook, all dressed up around midnight in a vanilla-flavored ice cream suit as pale and wan as the cheek of a paperback heroine, his face ratty and furtive under a spectacular Borsellino hat that cast a shadow across his left eye, natty and spiffy, but something twitchoid and on the move about him. And as I stood there waiting for Michael to come back so I could tell him how good some men are for some women, this ash inspector comes off the curb, looking smartly left and right up and down La Brea, watching for cars and also watching for typhoons, southwesters, Chiracos, monsoons, Compsons, Santa Anas, and a fall of heavy objects. And as I stood there, he came straight across the avenue and out of the sidewalk there at the front of Pink's, and he slouched to a halt right beside me and leaned up close with one elbow on the counter just touching my sleeve, and he thumbed back the Borsalino so I could see both of his strange dark little eyes set high in his feral, attractive, strange dark little face. And this is what he said to me, okay! This is it. Now listen up. The first girl I ever fell in love with was this raven trust little beauty who lived down the block from me when I was in high school in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. She was 16, I was 17, her father owned an apple orchard. Big deal, I said, big fucking deal, an apple orchard. We're not talking here the Sudeten land. Nonetheless, he thought he was landed gentry. My old man worked with his hands over in Kutztown. So we ran away, got all the way to Eunice, New Mexico, walking, hitching, slipping and sliding, sleeping out in the rain. She comes down with pneumonia and dies at a lion in hospital over at Carlsbad. I am shook. I am ruined. What I'm saying here, I was distraught. Next thing I know, I'm signed up with a merch marine, shipped out to Kowloon. 20 minutes in town on shore leave, I fall across this little transistor girl named Orange Blossom. I don't ask questions. Maybe her name was Sun Young Singh. How am I to know? She likes me, I like her. We go off hand in hand to make a little rice music if you catch my drift. Sweet, this was sweet. Two young kids, okay, it's miscegenation. A little intermingling of the Occidental with the Oriental. So what? It was purely, purely sweet. And we're talking here about cleaning up some bad leftover feelings. I treat her good. She has respect for an innocent young man. Everything's going only to Terrific. And we're walking up three Jade Lacquer Box Road looking for the sweet little dim sum joint that's been recommended to us when some nutcase off a harbor junk that caught fire and killed his wife and three kids comes running down the street brandishing a kukri, this large knife used for hunting and combat purposes by the Nepalese Gurkhas, and he sticks it right through this sweet little kid, possibly named Orange Blossom. And the next thing I know, she's lying in a pool of it right at my feet as this maniac goes screaming up three Jade Lacquer Box Road. Well, let me tell you, I'm devastated. Freaked out of my mind, I'm down on my knees wailing and crying. What else was there to do? So I get myself shipped back home to recuperate, try to blow it all away, try to forget my sorrow. They put me up in a VA hospital even though I'm not a vet. They figure, you know, the March Marines is good as the service. Well, I'm not in the hospital three days when I meet this terrific candy striper named Henrietta. Blonde hair, blue eyes, petite little figure, a warm and winning personality, Henrietta. She takes a real fancy to me, sees I'm in need of extensive chicken soup therapy, slips in late at night when the ward's quiet, and gets under the covers with me. We fall desperately in love. I'm on the mend. We go out to lightweight pizza dinners and G-rated movies. Move in with me, she says. When my time is up at the hospital, move in with me and we whistle a jaunty tune forever more. Okay, okay, says I. Okay, you got it. So I move in all my worldly possessions. I'm not there three weeks when she slips, boarding a number 10 uptown bus. The doors close on her left foot and she's dragged half a city block before the driver realizes the thumping sound is her head hitting the street. So I'm left with the lease on a four-room apartment in San Francisco. Now, you might think that's a real nice thing to have, what with the housing shortage. But I'm telling you, friend, without love, even a Taj Mahal is a cold water flamp. So I can't take it. I'm whipped, really downtrodden, sorrowful, and in misery. I know I shouldn't, but I get involved with this older woman on a rebound. She's 61, I'm 20, and all she can do is do for me. All right! I admit it, this wasn't much straight thinking, but I'm crippled, you know what I mean? I'm a help fledgling bird with a crippled wing. I need some taken care of, some bringing out of myself. She's good medicine, maybe a little on the wrinkled side, but who the hell says a 61-year-old woman ain't entitled to a little affection, too? Everything's going great, strictly great. I move with her on Knob Hill. We go for long walks, take in Bizet operas, Hungarian goulash in Ghirardelli Square. Oh, Open and frank discussions about clitoral stimulation and the Panama Canal. All good, all fine, until one night we go a little too deeply into the Kama Sutra, and she has this overwhelming uplifted celestial experience, which culminates in massive cardiac infarction, so I'm all adrift again, all alone on the tides of life, trying to find a soulmate with whom I can traverse the desert of loneliness. Then, in rapid succession, I meet Rosalinda, who gets polio and refuses to see me because she's going to be an invalid the rest of her life, Norma, whose father kills her because she's black and I'm white, and he's disappointed she'd rather be just a housewife or some white guy than the world's first black female heart transplant specialist, Jarmaine, who was very high on me till she got hit by a cinder block drop from a scaffold on a construction job where she was architect in training, working during her summer college session toward a degree in building stuff. Olive, who was a stewardess, who got along fine with me even though our political orientation was very different, until her dinner flight to Tucson came in a little too low and they sent me what was left of her in a very nice imitation, Sung Dynasty Vaz from the Federal Aeronautics Administration. And then Fernanda and Arwina and Corinne, all of whom wound up in a destructive relationship with married men. And finally I met Teresa, we'll call her Terry, she preferred Terry, but Teresa was her name, 
Terry, I'm going to call her Terry. I prefer Terry. I meet her at the practice, Terry. And we're both on the same horse, a nice little two-year-old, name of Leo Rising. And we get to the window at the same time, and I ask her, what's her sign? Because I overheard what horse she's betting. And she says, Virgo. And I say, I'm a Virgo. And I ask her, what's her rising sign? And she says, of course, Leo. And I say, so's mine. And the next thing I know, we're dating heavily. And she's gifted me with a sterling silver ID bracelet with my name on the front end, with love from Terry on the reverse. And I've gifted her with a swell couple strands of genuine natural simulated pearls. And we name the date and we post the bands, whatever the hell that means. And I meet her family and she can't meet mine because I haven't seen mine in about 20 years. And everything is going just swell when she's out in Beverly Hills trying to select her silver pattern and something simple but eloquent in Gorham. And they left a manhole cover off a sewer thing and she slips and falls in and breaks her back in 11 places, her neck and both arms. Sweet kid never comes out of the coma. They keep her on the machine nine months. One night her father slips in there on all fours and he chews off the plug on the electrical connection. She goes through a much needed piece. So that's it. That's the long and the short of it. Here I am, deeply distressed, not at all settled in my mind, all sixes and sevens, dulled in quite a bit, diminished, gloomy, apathetic, and washed in tribulation and misery, confused and once more barefoot on the road of life. Now what do you think of that? And he looks at me. I look back at him. <coughs> he snorts. Try and find a little human compassion. And he walks off, crosses La Brea at the corner, turns left onto Melrose, and disappears. I'm still standing there, staring at where he'd been when Michael comes over, having served the pimp and his staff. It had been three minutes. We're talking three minutes tops. What was that all about, he asks. I think I focused on him. On the other hand, I say, there are some guys who are strictly no goddamn good for a woman. Michael nods with satisfaction and hands me a frankfurter, light on the mustard, pleasantly devoid of relish.